On the 11th of November, 1918, the guns fell silent. The killing of the First World War stopped as an armistice with Germany was signed. Two months later, in January 1919, delegates from all over the world came to Paris to conclude the peace settlements that would end the war. Six months of haggling in conference rooms climaxed with the signing of a treaty with Germany in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Three men dominated the peacemaking, the American President Woodrow Wilson and the French and British Prime Ministers Georges Clemenceau and David Lloyd George. These peacemakers have often been seen as short-sighted and vindictive, whose bungling led to a chain of events which ended with Hitler and a second world war. But a generation of historians like Margaret Macmillan revisiting events in Paris are challenging this view of a failed peace with Germany. The trouble with hindsight is you know how the story ends. And so you look back for things that tell you that the story was bound to end this way. And that's not really how events unfold. These historians argue that the peace conference was a realistic attempt to shape the map of Europe. In many cases, they were dealing with factors way outside their control or anyone else's control, outside anyone's ability to control. How do you control ethnic nationalism? We haven't made such a great job of it today. They see Paris as a global summit with a liberal, progressive agenda for the world and urge greater understanding for the peacemakers of 1919 as they face dilemmas which remain grimly familiar to us today. This is their story. The First World War had left 10 million dead and twice that number seriously wounded and maimed for life. If you think of September the 11th, but then you think of September the 11th style casualties every day for four years, then you begin to get some kind of feeling of what the sort of trauma was that existed in the Western countries and the Allied countries at the time, particularly in Britain and in France, which had never known levels of casualties of the kind that they'd experienced between 1914 and 1918. Remember, these were casualties suffered by civilian armies, not just by regular soldiers, so every family in Britain and France would be likely to have had some experience of someone close to them who'd been killed or maimed. The British hadn't fought a war in Europe for a hundred years. They had never anticipated that so many troops would fight for so long. Nearly a million soldiers from Britain and its empire were killed. These losses were in numbers which had never been anticipated. And the sense of outrage and the sense that this was a tragedy of the deepest order grew from 1914 to 1918. Twenty-five percent of France's male population between 18 and 30 was either dead or wounded. The fighting had devastated whole areas of northern France. The retreating Germans destroyed farms, flooded mines, and looted factories. Germany, of course, had also suffered. By the end of the war, 1.8 million Germans were dead. But in November 1918, unlike at the end of the Second World War in 1945, there was no Allied invasion of Germany. The line drawn on the day of the armistice lay through Belgium and along Germany's western borders. Germany never saw Allied troops on German soil. The Germans themselves never saw Allied troops in occupation. The German army itself marched back from the frontiers in good order and it was greeted by the new president of the Republic who said, we welcome you, you haven't been defeated. So there was a feeling that victory was incomplete the peace conference would have to resolve this inconclusive end to the fighting and punish Germany. But the wider world the peacemakers also hoped to shape in Paris 
was in chaos. Not only the German Empire of the Kaiser, but Franz Josef's Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russia of the Tsars. All these power blocks had vanished by January 1919. The simultaneous collapse of four powers is unprecedented. It meant that the map of Europe would not look the same in 1919, whatever the peacemakers did, that this was a map which would have to be redrawn because the very blocks which had constituted Europe earlier no longer existed. Throughout the peace conference, there was quiet on the Western Front, but fighting continued in the East. Poles against Russians, Romanians against Hungarians. But how to deal with this? Allied troops were being quickly demobilized, and those who waited to go home were impatient, even mutinous. So during these months in Paris, there were always going to be severe limits to the power of the Allied leaders. Three weeks after the armistice, Woodrow Wilson, the American president, set sail for Europe. Wilson had had a meteoric rise in American politics. In 1910, he was a college president. Yet within only three years, leading the Democrats, Wilson entered the White House. After a period of neutrality, he led America to war in April 1917. Wilson had a Presbyterian belief in punishment for Germany, but he also believed in redemption. His 14 points addressed to Congress in January 1918 promised a new, more open diplomacy, a belief in national self-determination and the moral supremacy of democracy. The speech made Wilson a symbol of hope for the future. The president's arrival in December 1918, a superstar, was an extraordinary event. One young American on the president's staff described Wilson's reception in Paris. The parade from the station to the Murat House in Rue de Monceau, which is to be his official residence, was accompanied by the most remarkable demonstration of enthusiasm and affection on the part of Parisians that I've ever heard of, let alone seen. Troops, cavalry, and infantry lined the entire route, and tens of thousands of persons fought for a glimpse. The streets were decorated with flags and banners. Wilson's name was everywhere, stretched across the streets from house to house. He seemed to embody America, and that's, I think, a very important factor. America had entered world politics at this point, and many Europeans looked to it for salvation, really, from the ills of the old world, which was very much, of course, the American view themselves, that they were bringing um, peace and, and redemption, in a way, to the old world. The American delegation made its headquarters at the luxurious Hotel de Crillon on the Place de la Concorde. Life at the Crillon contrasted sharply with the simple lifestyle of the Prime Minister of France, Georges Clemenceau, living alone in a flat across the river in the 16th arrondissement. He was a very cultured man. He wrote books himself. He was a thinker, actually. He wrote even philosophical books, you know, not only memoirs and such uh, political uh, books. Uh, he had uh, also a big career behind him as a journalist, very good one. He had a huge political experience, and he was certainly a very witty man. As prime minister, Clemenceau had a polished contempt for the president of France, Raymond Poincaré. There are only two perfectly useless things in the world. One is an appendix, and the other is Poincaré. 
and Clemenceau reveled in his own nickname, the Tiger. He relished his image. He did everything to enhance that image because it was a political tool for him. His reputation as a, a killer, we would say today. Critics of his role at the peace conference saw Clemenceau as a weary product of the old world. But he'd become prime minister during the lowest point in the war and led France to victory. When news of the armistice was announced, he put his head in his hands and wept. Clemenceau had a political career which dated back to 1870, when, as mayor of Montmartre, he saw France defeated by Prussia, then occupied by the new Germany. So in the peacemaking, he had one simple aim, to protect France so that 1870 and 1914 would never happen again. On the 11th of January, 1919, the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George arrived in Paris. With Clemenceau and Wilson, Lloyd George completed the triumvirate of power in Paris. Everybody who knew him always commented on, on sort of the, the, the incredible amount of energy he had. Um, there's a story of, of Clemenceau going to the opera uh, and saying, you seeing the Barber of Seville, Figaro here, Figaro there, he says, he's a kind of Lloyd George. He was always moving about, always sort of full of energy and full of, full of ideas. And something like the, the peace conference in Paris, where he's working on a world stage, was simply made for Lloyd George. Like Clemenceau, Lloyd George had come to power during the dark days of the war and had recently been re-elected in coalition with the Conservatives in the Khaki election of December 1918. He had a reputation as a politician of infinite flexibility, but there was also substance to the Welsh wizard. He wanted a stable Europe, a Europe that would not again mean that Britain had to interfere in continental matters. Never again was Britain to send an army of the size of the Great War Army to the continent. And I think for him stability was of extreme importance. Lloyd George complained about Clemenceau's insistence that Paris was the venue for the peacemaking. I never wanted to hold a conference in his bloody capital. I thought it'd be better to hold it in a neutral place. But the old man wept and protested so much that we gave way. But as he later admitted, Paris during these six months was the time of his life. He set himself up in a luxurious flat with his secretary and mistress, Francis Stevenson. Balfour, his foreign secretary, lived one floor above and got used to hearing the sound of Lloyd George's favorite hymns and Negro spirituals drifting up. The rest of the 400-strong British Empire delegation was based at the Hotel Majestic on the Avenue Clébert. Here, there was an obsession with security. The British still didn't really trust their French allies all that much. And to ensure really maximum security, they fired all the French staff of the hotel, chefs included, and brought in staff from the Midlands, which meant that maybe they had security, although that was doubtful. But what it did mean was that they had really good, solid British food. And so they had big, cooked British breakfasts with lots of oatmeal porridge and so on. They had lots of boiled cabbage, lots of vegetables much to the fury, in fact, of many of the British Empire delegation who'd been looking forward to really good French food. Newsreel cameras were present to cover the official opening of the peace conference on the 18th of January, 1919. It took place in the Salle de l'Horloge, at the French Foreign Ministry at the Quai d'Orsay. 32 countries sent delegates to Paris, and following the official delegations were all those who looked to the peacemakers to change the world for them as well.
six months, it was the closest we have ever had to a world government, and I don't suspect we'll ever have anything like it again. You can imagine all the most powerful people in the world here, prime ministers, kings, presidents, foreign secretaries, plus all the people who came because they were here. You had suffragettes coming, you had African Americans, you had black Africans, you had the Koreans who came from Siberia. Unfortunately, they got there too late because they started out by dog sled and it was too slow. But everybody came here, and so for six months, this was the world government. Woodrow Wilson insisted that a League of Nations was the first item on the conference agenda. This would be a permanent international organization to put into practice the ideals the president had advocated during the war. The League of Nations to him was the most important thing, the thing that above all he wanted to get out of the negotiations and the peace treaty. It would be the thing which above all would justify his decision in bringing America into the war. The deaths of 10 million men had created a determination to break with the past. Harold Nicholson, part of the British delegation, reflected a passionate desire for change. We were journeying to Paris, not merely to liquidate the war, but to found a new order in Europe. We were preparing not peace only, but eternal peace. There was about us the halo of some divine mission. We must be alert, stern, righteous, and ascetic, for we were bent on doing great, permanent, and noble things. The League of Nations was so important to Wilson that he chaired the commission deciding its structure. Meetings took place in room 351 at the Crillon, the suite of Colonel House, the president's closest advisor. What happened in this room was, was what people at the time thought was probably the single greatest achievement of the Paris Peace Conference. The League of Nations was basically made in this room, in House's rooms. The Commission for the League of Nations started meeting on February the 3rd. They sat around a big table in this room, covered with a great big red cloth, about 19 members in that commission, and they hammered out what was called the Covenant of the League of Nations. It, it had almost a religious connotation because for Woodrow Wilson, this was the great gift that he was bringing to the world. But Clemenceau scoffed at Wilson's idealism. The president's ambitions seemed far too messianic for his liking. God himself was content with ten commandments. Wilson modestly inflicted 14 points on us. The 14 commandments of the most empty theory. Clemenceau wanted a little more real politique, the iron fist in the velvet glove. He was all for new international system because he was a liberal he believed in Wilson's ideas to that extent but at the same time he deeply resented the fact that Wilson was not pragmatic enough Clemenceau was in favor of a League of Nations but he would have wanted a League of Nations with a very strong military establishment League of Nations with teeth and without the Germans that's why that was Clemenceau's position the search for a new world order had quickly been complicated by conflicting opinion amongst the Allies about the use of their power. Competing national agendas would divide the peacemakers for the duration of the conference. Wilson proved to be an effective chairman of the League's commission. Despite disagreements, a draft covenant had been agreed by the 13th of February. So the president decided on a short visit home to begin the hard sell of the League to a skeptical Congress. By the time of this midwinter break, delegates had discovered the many delights of Paris. By day, skating in the Bois de Boulogne. By night, tasting the capital's more racier pleasures. Hotel Majestic, entertainment was peculiarly British. Well, it was very British, and a lot of the, the, the foreigners found it really rather extraordinary. Amateur theatricals, poetry readings, people had written their own poetry, um, charades, dancing. They had tea dances every Saturday. 
which became so rowdy, in fact, that the British authorities wondered if they better put a stop to them. There's a wonderful story that Marshal Foch came to see the dancing one evening. And these days, of course, they were doing things like the black bottom and the foxtrot. And he's reported to have said, why do the British have such sad faces and such jolly bottoms? One British representative from the center of Europe who came hot foot to Paris to try and warn people about things that were collapsing there said that when he got here he couldn't get anyone interested in the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire because they were all too busy talking about the next amateur theatrical. Harold Nicholson met Marcel Proust for dinner at the Ritz. The novelist was fascinated by the peacemaking and demanded Proustian detail about how exactly it worked. Tell me about the committees. You take a car from the delegation, you get out at the Quai d'Orsay. You climb the stairs, you go into the room, and then... Be specific, my friend, be specific! And serving at the Ritz was a young kitchen assistant from Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh. The future revolutionary sent a petition to the peace conference, requesting independence from France for his country. He got no reply. Canada's legal expert wrote to his wife about the culture to be had in Paris. Something earthy of the Folie Bergère, something a little more elevating at the opera. But wherever he went, he was struck by the women of Paris. He also described French women, how elegant they were on the stage and off, how sometimes they didn't wear very many clothes, how attractive their ankles were. At this point, his wife wrote to him and said, I'm coming over to join you. He wrote then um, a very persuasive letter saying, I would love you to come, of course I adore you, but I should point out that Paris is about to have a revolution. You will not get enough to eat. Um, you probably won't have anywhere decent to stay. In fact, you may have to walk back to the Channel ports for safety. Wonderful letter, and she didn't come. But the lawman from Canada was right about a hungry continent, seemingly on the brink of revolution. Beyond the salons and dining rooms of Paris, Europe was mentally and physically exhausted. Communism was spreading from the east following the success of the Bolsheviks in Russia. There had been insurrection in Germany. A communist government would soon be established in Hungary the heart of the old Habsburg Empire. They see Bolsheviks as a shorthand for chaos, for anarchy, for famine, for the lack of traditional authority. And given that much of Eastern and Central Europe was now without a recognized government, the fear was that if you did not make a settlement quickly, then the plague, the bacillus, the germ of Russian communism would spread into Eastern and Central Europe among defeated people, among disillusioned people. And this was a really serious threat to the whole, to the whole conference. And on the 19th of February, there was a reminder of this unstable world. As Clemenceau was leaving his flat on the Rue Franklin, he was shot by an anarchist, Émile Cotin. He survived to complain about his would-be assassin's marksmanship. A Frenchman who misses his target six times out of seven at point-blank range. Boff! When Woodrow Wilson returned on the 14th of March to Paris, it was obvious that his honeymoon with the French was over. When Wilson came back, the atmosphere was markedly different. I mean, it was decidedly cool. When you think of the wildly enthusiastic crowds who greeted him in December 1918, there was almost none of that in the middle of March 1919. The French press were very hostile. And they made jokes about Mrs. Wilson. They said her skirts were too short and she didn't know how to dress properly, which in Paris was a pretty mean thing to say. As the three leaders met again at the Hotel de Crillon, there was a renewed urgency to their deliberations. Now the central preoccupation of the peace conference was the final settlement with Germany, the Treaty of Versailles. 
it was agreed that Germany should be punished for the recent catastrophe. The Allies believed that Germany had started the war and should pay for its aggression. And the leaders had promised their electorates that Germany would pay. Lloyd George and Clemenceau have public opinion at home which is expecting Britain and France to seek the full costs of the war from Germany. Britain's just had a general election. In that general election, one government minister has said that I am for squeezing Germany until the pips squeak. A reparations committee met in the splendor of the Ministry of Finance on the Rue de Rivoli. Delegates briefed by the leaders tried to decide what Germany could or should pay and who might get these reparations. Arguments continued night and day. Oh, at times it got really heated because they were squabbling over figures and they were squabbling over the share of the pie. The two countries that got particularly heated were the British and the French. The British because they felt the French were grabbing too much, the French because they felt the British weren't giving them their just desserts. The French and the Americans, funnily enough, actually worked out a modus vivendi and, and, and really came together on a figure. And it was the British who held out for the very high figure. And so, yes, you had real arguments over it. There was also disagreement about how the borders of Germany should be changed to try and prevent another war. It was agreed that the provinces of Alsace-Lorraine, taken during the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, should go back to France. But after 1914, the French wanted more to guarantee security and prosperity, a zone of security on the River Rhine, and control of the Saar coal fields. What France is trying to look for is a secure boundary against Germany something which could never be quite as secure as the Channel and certainly not as secure as the Atlantic. Both Lloyd George and Wilson already had security when they came to Paris in 1919. The German fleet had gone. There was no threat to either of them directly. But Clemenceau would have liked to have seen some form of physical barrier between himself and Germany. Wilson objected that this went against the principle of national self-determination. People in the Rhineland were German, he argued they should be able to choose the country they lived in. Lloyd George saw the potential for future conflicts. As Lloyd George puts it, the key concern this time is not to create Alsace-Lorenz in reverse and have a situation where territories that are inhabited by Germans and want to be part of Germany are under French or Polish occupation and rule, because that, he thinks, will create an unstable settlement in the future, the Germans will not accept it, and you'll have continuing tension and probably eventually another war in a few years' time. This fundamental tension between borders and self-determination, highlighted by the Rhineland, was being duplicated all over Europe. By the time the conference opened, states were already emerging from the wreckage of empire. All the peacemakers could do was try and fix the borders of these new additions to the map in accordance with their liberal ideals. The problem about solving the collapse of the empires in Eastern and Central Europe, which was compound, compounded, of course, by the fact that the one principle which was left at the end of the war was Wilson's idea of self-determination, the idea that people should be allowed to choose what state they belong to. And that was going to be very, very difficult to apply in Eastern and Central Europe, which had seen invasions, migrations, people coming and going, some people staying, some people going on, little pools of people left all across the seashore of Eastern and Central Europe. Experts who met at the Quai d'Orsay struggled long and hard to find solutions. Here in the Grand Banqueting Hall, many of the territorial commissions met. And so they read the submissions, they interviewed the witnesses, they pored over the maps, they argued among themselves as they tried to draw fair and rational boundaries. What they were trying to do was impose order on a world in 1919 that was irrational and disorderly. For Harold Nicholson, it was agonizing work. How fallible one feels here. A map, a pencil, tracing paper. Yet my courage fails at the thought of the people whom our errant lines enclose or exclude. The happiness of several thousand people. And this work was made even more difficult by the demands of the emerging nations. At the Hotel Champs-Élysées stayed a delegation from Poland, a nation which had disappeared at the end of the 18th century, but had come back to life almost by historical accident during the First World War. 
the Polish delegation came to the Quai d'Orsay to argue their case. They wanted the great Poland of the past, stretching from the Baltic to the Black Sea. But this would include Germans, Ukrainians, Lithuanians and Russians. The country would also include significant communities of Jews. With pogroms in recent memory, there was deep concern about the anti-Semitism that came with Polish nationalism. The problem of minorities in Poland was evident elsewhere. The statesmen in, in Paris became aware uh, as they tried to draw up the frontiers that they simply weren't going to produce frontiers on which everybody was going to be on the right side at the end of them. There were bound to be people who were going to be left in a country they didn't want to be part of, who would themselves be almost the living personification of the fact that national self-determination didn't work. So the peacemakers found a solution which tried to protect the rights of these national minorities. Separate agreements were drawn up which would safeguard religious protection, language rights and schooling, and offer plebiscites or referendums in disputed areas. But could liberal solutions be found for settlements outside Europe? If Paris was to be the start of a brave new world, then what should be done about the old traditions of dividing up the spoils of war? In 1919, there were some very tempting prizes. The colonies of Imperial Germany in Africa and the Pacific, and the riches of the collapsed Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. Something like a million square miles of territory, 14 million people scattered across the world are, if you like, up for grabs. But the Paris Peace Conference once again sets itself higher ideals than previous settlements would have done. To Wilson, there should be no land grabs or annexations by the victors. Another solution must be found involving the League of Nations. The answer found in Paris was mandates. A civilized country, say Britain, would be given the opportunity to look after a less civilized part of the world until that country matured into nationhood. Oh, I think mandates had a very paternalistic attitude behind them that these peoples in the Middle East, these peoples in Africa, these peoples in Asia, these peoples in the South Pacific weren't in any way ready to rule themselves. It's really interesting actually, someone asked Woodrow Wilson if he'd like to do mandates in the center of Europe in the old collapsed Austro-Hungarian Empire and he looked totally stunned and said, no, no, we don't need mandates for Europeans. And so yes, there was a paternalistic and, and indeed perhaps even a racist attitude here. Another group who came to the Quai d'Orsay, petitioning for independence, was an Arab delegation, led by Prince Faisal, advised by T.E. Lawrence. One of the most dramatic appearances at the Supreme Council was that of Prince Faisal, the Arab leader. He was dressed in flowing robes, he had a gold scimitar at his side, and he spoke passionately in Arabic, apparently outlining the Arab case. His interpreter was Lawrence of Arabia, and it has been suggested by some that Faisal was simply reciting the Quran, while Lawrence, who of course knew the Arab case well, presented it. Faisal wanted the old Ottoman provinces of Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra, Mesopotamia. But this future state of Iraq was also coveted by the British, who'd taken the area from the Turks during the war. At his flat on the Rue Nito, an advisor overheard Lloyd George thinking out loud about the Middle East. Mesopotamia, yes, oil, irrigation, we must have Mesopotamia. Palestine, yes, the Holy Land, Zionism, we must have Palestine. Syria, hmm, what is there in Syria? Let the French have that. The British had strong interests in the Middle East, which were always going to conflict with the idea of Arab independence. The British were very keen to maintain the security of the Suez Canal, to maintain the security of the Persian Gulf, and clearly the new strategic element of oil. For this reason, Britain began to press vigorously for a mandate in what would become Iraq. It gave little real self-determination to the Arabs. And when the British mandate was finally ratified by the League of Nations, there was no attempt to include Faisal in the decision. A separate deal between Britain and France confirmed British control of Mosul in northern Iraq, but agreed French access to its oil fields. <laughs> 
resentment about the settlement led to immediate revolt and a bitterness which would endure. During the April of 1919, the weather was grim in Paris and the volume of business was mounting up. A German treaty to include the covenant for a League of Nations still hadn't been agreed. And there were now other obstacles to the success of the peace conference. The Allied leaders were meeting daily at Wilson's new residence on the Place Etats Unis, opposite Lloyd George's flat. Since January, the Italian Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando had been present at these meetings. Up until now, this fourth ally had registered little interest in the proceedings. It's Easter Sunday, and Francis Stevenson was standing by the window looking out across to President Wilson's house just across the road here. Francis Stevenson was Lloyd George's secretary, but she was also his mistress, so they had a very close relationship. And he had promised to take her out for a picnic. And she was looking across to see if the meeting of the big four had just ended. And as she looked across, she saw standing at the window of President Wilson's study, Orlando, the Prime Minister of Italy, and he was weeping copiously. And so she stood there in horror, wondering what had happened. And Lord George's valet, who was standing beside her, said, what on earth have they done to the poor old gentleman? What they had done was to refuse Italian demands in the Adriatic. These Wilson angrily opposed, provoking the Italians' tears. This clash between the two leaders was serious enough to provoke a walkout by the Italian delegation. And there was now trouble from a fifth wartime ally, Japan. The Japanese, though staying in some style on the Place Vendôme, always felt ill at ease in Paris. Clemenceau, for one, was openly rude to them. They were treated with a certain amount of condescension. The two Japanese representatives in Paris were called the two Mikados. And Clemenceau, for example, used to make loud asides. He said, you know, it's a beautiful day outside, and there's so many beautiful women in the world, and here we are, shut up with those ugly Japanese, in rather a loud voice, too. I bet they heard him. Um, you know, there was an attitude that the Japanese were there really as a courtesy. The Japanese delegation represented a nation which had had an astonishing rise to power. By 1919, they had taken Korea and Manchuria in China. So the Japanese came to Paris looking for respect. And this was expressed in their demand for a racial equality clause in the League's covenant. The Japanese wanted to have racial equality clause inserted into the covenant of the League of Nations. Um, mainly because they were very concerned about their prestige and security as the only non-white great power to be invited to the Paris Peace Conference. Um, and then there was also the question of immigration, or more precisely anti-Japanese immigration in, in, in the United States and also in Australia in particular. And they wanted to resolve this problem. Because of this fear of Japanese immigration, Racial equality was furiously opposed by the Australian Prime Minister, Billy Hughes. Hughes and allies in the Empire delegation feared for their whites-only immigration policies. Wilson, realizing he now had a problem over racial equality, used a meeting of the League Commission at the Crayon to veto the Japanese amendment. Well, I think it shows again his pragmatism, I think. I mean, actually, I don't think he himself was a great believer in racial equality. He himself had been brought up in the South, and although his attitudes towards uh, blacks were, as it were, sympathetic rather than antagonistic, they were premised on a kind of paternalist assumption of superiority, which he certainly had. The Japanese now demanded a quid pro quo. Japan had taken possessions in the Shantung Peninsula in China from the Germans during the war. They now wanted their claims recognized. If not, the Japanese delegation made it clear they would walk out of the conference too. But in Paris, there was a Chinese delegation. Its leader, Wellington Ku, dramatically called the Japanese claim a dagger pointed at the heart of China. <laughs> 
Ku argued that Shantung, under the principle of self-determination, was clearly Chinese. But again, to stop the conference falling apart, Wilson decided to horse trade, agreeing to the Japanese claim. The Chinese reaction to the Shantung settlement was um, an incredible disappointment, as well as the sense of betrayal, um, both by Wilson himself, who was personally seen as the embodiment of Wilsonian idealism, but also, more broadly speaking, these principles of new diplomacy um, that Wilson was advocating at Paris. The decisions made in Paris would have long-term consequences in the Far East. Disillusion in China would lead to the replacement of those like Ku, who believed political solutions lay in Western liberal democracy, with those who saw the future in a Chinese form of communism. A similar totalitarian fate awaited Japanese liberals. Japan felt deeply betrayed by the Anglo-Saxon West, um, particularly the United States and, and Britain. And this meant, of course, that it led to the rise of more nationalistic um, streak of thought in Japan. By the beginning of May, the weather had improved, and the countdown to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles with the Germans had begun. Invitations had now gone to Berlin, requesting that a delegation travel to Paris to receive the Allied terms. After long hours of haggling in conference rooms, deals had been struck. Lloyd George and Wilson kick-started the process by offering Clemenceau guarantees of military support if France was attacked by Germany again. Lloyd George made another offer. Well, Lloyd George loved the dramatic gesture, so what he said to the French is, look, even if the Germans attack again, which I doubt they will, we are going to build a tunnel under the channel. It's one of Lloyd George's dreams. And so, if the Germans attack, we'll simply pop through the tunnel, up we'll be, and we'll be there giving you aid. The French, understandably, didn't really believe it. The traditional view of the Versailles Treaty is that the peacemakers, particularly the French, were inflexible. But in finding agreement on the final terms, there had to be compromise on all sides. Clemenceau softened the French position on the military occupation of the Rhine by agreeing that it should be demilitarized for 15 years. The Saar coal fields would be owned by France, with sovereignty decided by a League of Nations plebiscite. Clemenceau knew perfectly well that the treaty was not perfect from the French uh, point of view. He could not uh, achieve the military border on the Rhine, permanent occupation of the Rhineland. He knew that, he understood that. Uh, and there was a discussion in France. Uh, the president of the Republic, uh, Poincaré, told Clemenceau, you must not accept the treaty as it is. But Clemenceau decided to accept the treaty, treaty because he believed that the most important thing was to retain English, English and American support. Historians now believe that the overall territorial settlement left Germany better off in 1919 than it had been before the war. Perhaps the peacemakers had been too lenient, storing up trouble for the future. Germany as a political entity is left as it was before the war in, in the sense that it's still there. And that's very important. Uh, Germany loses something like 13% of its pre-war territory, something like 10% of its pre-war population. And in some senses, of course, at the end of the First World War, it's in a bad way, it's been defeated, it, it's, it's not, it's not in, in a good condition. But uh, if you look at the future, Germany no longer has its borders policed on almost all sides by great powers. At the Ministry of Finance, the Reparations Commission had also come to an agreement. A split of the money, 52% France, 28% Britain, the rest to the other allies, with a final figure to be agreed after the conference. The great liberal economist John Maynard Keynes, working with the Treasury team in Paris, was furious with this deal. Germany, he believed, could never afford the kind of figures suggested by the allies its economy would be crippled. With this deal, the Allies were completing the destruction of Europe. For Keynes, Wilson was the hapless villain of the peace. 
This blind and deaf Don Quixote was entering a cavern where the swift and glittering blade was in the hands of the adversary. Keynes accused Wilson of doing nothing to challenge the other allies when his own experts had been critical of their demands. He thought the president had been conned. He allowed himself to be drugged by their atmosphere to discuss on the basis of their plans and of their data and to be led along their paths. But Wilson was a politician, not an economist. He knew he had to give something back to the French and British in return for getting his own way with the League of Nations. And an aide was telling him that liberal guilt over reparations was simply not an issue in America. Tumulty in Washington wrote him to say, remember that reparations is primary of interest to the Europeans. It's not a central issue with Americans. And it's not worth wrecking the conference about. From our point of view, what matters to us is the League. Um, and I think, again, this sense of American domestic opinion and its priorities affected Wilson's own attitude. So though he made this case, he eventually acceded in, it, in its essence to the Allied point of view. Most historians now argue that reparations were never the burden that critics like Keynes made out. Out of an agreed figure of £6 billion, only a billion had been paid by the Germans when payments were suspended in 1932. And they conclude this revisionist analysis by challenging the view that decisions made in Paris led to the outbreak of the Second World War. There was simply too much history in between. The peace settlement in, in Paris was not ideal. But it wasn't of itself sufficient to cause another major war. That was going to take uh, a series of, of happenstances, the problem of the Great Depression, the problem of the, the Great Slump in, in, in America, 1929 and all that, and the consequences which that would have for Europe, and perhaps most importantly of all, the arrival on the scene of the National Socialists in Germany. The whole series of events in the 1930s changed the European system and prepared the way for the outbreak of the Second World War. That is a mistake to jump from 1919 to 1939. By the first week of May 1919, a German delegation had checked into the Hotel des Reservoirs at Versailles. The special trains taking them through northern France had been deliberately slowed down by the French to allow the enemy to ponder on the devastation it had caused. big three were there, Clemenceau, Lloyd George, Wilson, their foreign ministers, the representatives of all the other powers, there were journalists, there were admirals, there were generals, and what they were seeing for the first time, most of them, was a German. These were the people they defeated, they hadn't seen Germans since 1914 except on the other side of the Western Front, and now they were going to see them face to face. The head of the German delegation, Foreign Minister Brockdorf Ransau, took two speeches with him to the Trianon, one short and non-committal, the other long and defiant. The German foreign minister decided to use the hardline speech. He was very nervous. People who were close to him could see beads of sweat on his forehead. He was probably shaking. Because of that, he decided to sit down. His legs were probably, would probably have given away underneath him. He sat at the table in the middle of this room, packed with the allies, and read out this hardline speech. He read it in a very harsh and rasping voice. And of course, he looked the picture of a German aristocrat, the sort of person who had helped lead Germany into the First World War. If he had wanted to do something, it would harden Allied opinion even more. He couldn't have chosen a better way to do it. Woodrow Wilson came away and said, I have never seen a worse speech. And Lloyd George said, now I understand why people hate the Germans so much. As he left the hotel, Brockdorf Ransau paused for a cigarette. 
whilst the Germans were given a deadline to respond to the treaty, General Foch, Commander-in-Chief of Allied Forces, was told to prepare 42 divisions to invade Germany if its leaders refused to sign. The publication of the treaty deepened liberal disillusion with the peace conference. In January, Paris had been a symbol of hope for Harold Nicholson. Now there was bitterness. We came to Paris confident that the new order was about to be established. We left it convinced that the new order had merely fouled the old. We arrived as fervent apprentices in the school of President Wilson. We left as renegades. And doubts had spread to leading members of the British delegation. Lloyd George went back to Clemenceau and Wilson to suggest revisions. They refused on matters of substance to budge. Wilson was keen on being seen as tough towards the Germans. He was told by Joe Tumulty, his political secretary in Washington, who read the American press and kept his ear very close to the ground, that the German draft treaty, which was produced on, in early May and which liberals were so horrified by, and which people like Keynes and Bullitt and the others were so shocked by, had actually been well received in America. The, the sort of um, quite belligerent sentiment of the previous autumn meant that uh, Americans generally were in favor of a tough peace. On the 16th of June, a final ultimatum was sent to Berlin. The German government, represented by Brockdorf Ranzau in Paris, resigned. On the 23rd of June at 4.30 in the afternoon, a telegram arrived at the Quai d'Orsay with the news that members of a new German government would sign. As soon as this was replied to, guns went off all over Paris. The signing ceremony took place on the 28th of June in the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. The Italians had been persuaded to come back and sign. The Chinese, however, stayed away, their hotel surrounded by protesting students. The signing was a deliberate piece of political theater by Georges Clemenceau. He never forgot that the Hall of Mirrors was where the new German Empire had been proclaimed in 1871 after Prussia had defeated, then occupied France. The whole signing of the Treaty of Versailles at Versailles in the Hall of Mirrors was enormously important for the French. And the Hall of Mirrors had been Louis XIV's great hall in his great palace when France under Louis XIV had dominated Europe. It was in the Hall of Mirrors in 1871 that the new German Empire had been proclaimed. And so it was going to be now in the Hall of Mirrors that Germany signed the treaty which marked its defeat. And so Clemenceau planned it very thoroughly. He made sure that there was a special writing desk which had belonged to Louis XIV there. He made sure that there was a special inkstand that, that was there. He made sure that sitting in the front row in the Hall of Mirrors when the Germans came in were badly, grievously, horribly mutilated French war veterans. At three in the afternoon, the Germans were shown in. The Hall of Mirrors was crammed. I mean, there's this huge audience there, the, the cameras, the film cameras there, and journalists there, a crowd looking through the windows trying to see what's going on. And the Germans are shown in, these two men in black suits who have finally agreed to represent the German government, sign the treaty, and there's a hush in the hall. And they're shown in, and they're dead white and trembling. And they come in and they sign the treaty and there's this sort of terrible hush. And, and people almost feel sympathetic for them because they look so ill with the emotion of the moment. And then all the other nations have to come and sign the treaty as well. And then the dignity begins to break down a bit. The first autograph seekers begin to get up. I'm ashamed to say one of them was a Canadian. In Paris, the celebrations began.
George left his Paris flat for the last time. He would stay in power until October 1922, when his coalition government fell and he was forced to resign as prime minister. He remained a backbench MP until just before his death in 1945. At the end of 1919, Clemenceau stepped down as prime minister to try and become president of France. But he had too many enemies in French politics. So the tiger left Paris to travel the world and to enjoy the role of heroic elder statesman. He died in 1929. Wilson was pragmatic about the peace conference. As he left France, the president confided to his wife, Well, little girl, it is finished. And as no one is satisfied, it makes me hope we have made a just peace. But it is all in the lap of the gods. Wilson the Democrat went on an exhausting U.S. tour to sell the Paris settlement to the American people. On his return to Washington in October 1919, he had a massive stroke. The Republican-controlled Senate then refused to ratify the Versailles Treaty, rejecting U.S. membership of the League of Nations. Wilson's term as president would end in March 1921, his dreams seemingly unfulfilled his career ending in political failure. He died in February 1924. As an invalid in the White House, Wilson requested a viewing of a film which had been made about his trip to Europe. It was a reminder of his glory days. But watching these images of Paris also reminds us of Wilson's vision his attempt to actively involve America in the world, his belief that an international body could be a force for good. And they remind us too of the peacemaker's determination in Paris to resolve war by compromise and conciliation, to prevent war by states working together to preserve the peace, to neutralize the power and violence of nationalism. Struggling in 1919, with the very same problems we still can't resolve today. Stay with us tonight as superstar Russian soprano Anna Netrebko sings popular arias by Puccini, Bellini and Vorjak with the BBC Philharmonic. The last night of the BBC Four Proms, next. <laughs> 